Hey Jesse is a bi-weekly podcast with interview episodes coming to you every Friday and weekly episodes coming to you every Tuesday. Now with that being said, be sure to comment, like, share and subscribe to this podcast on any of your listening platforms. Your engagement is greatly appreciated. Hello everyone and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we witnessed the Empire of Aksum be humiliated in a failed attempt to conquer the Himyarites of Arabia, and saw its entire Arabian territory fall. The Aksumite kings who followed this disaster ruled conservatively, focusing their efforts on improving Aksum internally instead of focusing on wars of expansion. This week, we will examine the life of King Izana, one of Aksum's greatest and most prestigious rulers. Let's begin. Episode 17, The Great King Izana. When it comes to nations, both ancient and modern, most possess a certain leader whose name has transcended their individual life and has become essentially synonymous with the history of that nation as a whole. The type of person that will provoke even people with only a passing interest in history to say things like, oh yeah, I've heard of the Romans. That's like, Caesar, right? Well, if Oxumite history received the mainstream historical attention it deserved, then King Azana would be on the short list of candidates to become a similar figure. To which people would say, Oh yeah, I've heard of Oxum. That's like, Izana, right? Among scholars of Oxumite history, he is typically regarded as one of, if not the single most influential, effective, and successful leaders in the history of Oxum. The ripples of the impact of Izana's reign still shape the history of Ethiopia, Eritrea, and their neighbors to this day. He conquered empires that existed since thousands of years before his birth, and created the basis for a religion that would last for thousands of years after his death. If Oxum were added to the video game series, Sid Meier's Civilization, Izana would be a strong choice to serve as the face of Oxumite civilization. If I haven't made my point clear yet, Izana is kind of a big deal in Oxumite history. Nobody is born a king, however. Izana, whose name would go down in the history books as a legendary ruler, was, at the start of our story, just another baby. Like all infants, he ate, cried, used the bathroom, and did little to nothing else. However, so soon into his existence, Izana's life would change forever. Before he was even old enough to speak in complete sentences, his father, King Usanas of Aksum, passed away. With his father's death, the toddler suddenly became the first in line to the throne of Aksum. Now, for obvious reasons, having a toddler rule your country is not the best idea so it was immediately clear to everyone in the Aksumite court that someone else was going to have to become the regent and handle the affairs of state while little Azana grew up. Though he was too young to understand it, this was a vulnerable time for the young monarch. An infant king on the throne is a prime opportunity for pretenders, whether they be a relative of the old king or an influential noble, to insert themselves into the regency, or maybe even try to replace him with their own royal line of succession. Fortunately for Azana, his mother, Queen Sophia, defeated these rivals for the position and became the regent of Oxum throughout Izana's childhood. With his mother running the state and protecting his status as heir, Izana was able to experience a relatively normal upbringing in the royal palace. The Oxum in which Izana grew up in was one of increasing cultural and religious plurality. If you were to take a stroll around the streets of 4th century Oxum, you would likely hear a multitude of languages. The most common language you would hear is Gaez the primary language of the Oxumites, but you would also hear many other minority languages of the Ethiopian highlands, brought by peoples from all over the Oxumite Empire who immigrated to the capital. These include the ancestors to the modern languages of Amharic, Tigrinya, Beja, and Aga. As a global hub of commerce, Oxum was also a popular destination for business-minded people from all over the world. Foreign merchants littered the streets of Oxum, speaking in their various tongues from all over Europe, the Middle East, and India. In an Oxumite market, it wouldn't be a surprising sight to see a merchant from Syria and a merchant from Italy competitively haggling to get the best price on a sheet of silk sold by a merchant from India. But these merchants brought more with them than just their valuable wares. They also brought their cultures, and, importantly for the life of Izana, their religions. Early in East African history, the religion of the Ethiopian highlands was largely a transplant from southern Arabia. When the cities of the coastal highlands joined the confederation of Sava around 800 BC, they also began worship of the Sabaean gods. The god that headed the Sabaean pantheon, the moon god Al-Makkah, was equally revered in the cities of East Africa. 
However, with the fall of the Sabaean Confederation, and the later Demot Confederation that followed it, the Sabaean influence in the region gradually declined as well, and the worship of these gods generally fell out of favor. In their place, a triumvirate of new powerful gods became the primary objects of worship in East Africa, and they would remain the most important gods throughout the early years of Oxum. The first of these gods was Ostar, a Mesopotamian import. Ostar was a god of thunderstorms, and was a popular focus of worship among the non sabaean tribes of Arabia. He also served as the patron god of farmers and nobility, as the rain he brought was necessary for the cultivation of their fields. The second major Oxumite god was Maher, the god of war. He was the son of Ostar and was the patron deity of Oxumite soldiers, generals, and kings. Finally, there is Beher, the god of the sea, and the patron of Oxum's merchant class. In terms of religion, the Oxumite government was incredibly tolerant for its time. Generally, as long as a subject of Oxum recognized the supremacy of the king and paid all their taxes, which gods they worshipped were not a matter of concern for the state. Worship of other cultures' pantheons, such as Greek or Egyptian gods, was commonplace throughout the Oxumite Empire. The king of Oxum, who claimed to be a descendant of Maher, could rationalize allowing this worship by claiming that the Oxumite gods were simply a different understanding of the same pantheon. This system is both similar and different from their northern neighbors, the Romans. Throughout most of its history, the Romans tolerated a multitude of religions so long as they engaged in religious sacrifices to the emperor. This resulted in most religions being tolerated by the Roman state, but with a few becoming especially troublesome. The first of these was Judaism. The relationship between the Roman Empire and the Jewish people was a complicated one. During the early stages of Roman rule in Judea, they often struggled to make their Jewish citizens conduct sacrifices to the emperor, resulting in numerous rebellions when the Roman authorities tried to force their hand. As a result of these rebellions and their subsequent crushing by the Romans, many Jews chose to flee Judea, south into Egypt. From there, a fraction of these refugees fled even further south, down the Nile, eventually arriving in the Semian Mountains of Ethiopia. There, they joined a small pre-existing Jewish community, known as the Beta Israelites, strengthening their numbers. If you'd like to learn more about the more recent history of this fascinating group of Ethiopian Jews, you can access my premium episodes by subscribing to the show's Patreon, which you can find linked on our website. For just $1.99, you gain access to all of our premium episodes, which focuses on subjects of African history that I want to talk about but can't think of a good place to discuss in our main episodes. I mean, come on, that's knowledge for just the price of four gumballs. Anyways, the other group, and the one which was more important to our story today, is the Christians. Christianity, a religion that itself was Jewish in origin, was even more adamant in its disdain for the deification of Roman emperors. This was the primary reason that Christians would later become a target of persecution within the Roman state, being more or less intense during certain eras, but the general threat of persecution led many Christians within the Roman world to keep their faith a secret. Oxum, on the other hand, tolerated Christians and Jews in the same way they tolerated any other religion. While the kings of Oxum claimed descent from the god of war, Macher, they did not require subjects to make mass sacrifices to them independently. Rather, deification ceremonies were optional, and were largely carried out with state resources. In this religiously tolerant environment, Christianity received a small, but devoted following within Oxum. While most of the nobility and peasant classes continued practicing the old ways, the Christian religion began to grow among the cosmopolitan merchant class. One of the people who adopted elements of this new faith was the queen regent of Oxum and Azana's mother, Sophia. Christianity became a large influence in the life of Azana's mother. It's unlikely that she ever officially converted, but Sophia was known to frequent Christian communities, and likely even held some sympathies for the Christian religion at the very least. Most importantly, she entrusted the education of her son to a Christian named Frumentius. Frumentius was born in the city of Tyre in modern-day Lebanon to a family of ethnically Greek Christian merchants. As a teenager, Frumentius usually stayed home, managing the books and documentation of his family's mercantile affairs. However, feeling adventurous, one day Frumentius asked to accompany his brother and uncle on a routine trade voyage to Ethiopia. Not seeing the harm in allowing his nephew to finally participate in a more hands-on side of the family business, his uncle allowed him to come along. But Frumentius proved to be something of a bad luck charm on the voyage. 
when his uncle's boat docked at a city along the Nubian coast in an ordinary stop for supplies and repairs, the whole crew was massacred by a group of bandits. Luckily for Frumentius, the bandits took mercy on him and his brother, instead capturing them and selling them as slaves to King Usanas of Oxum. In Oxum, they worked as servants in the royal palace. Apparently, the young boys made quite a positive impression on the king, becoming two of his favorite servants. In fact, the king seemed to have noticed that Frumentius possessed a strong experience in finance, and promoted him to the position of royal accountant. On his deathbed, King Usanas declared that Frumentius and his brother were released from their servitude. The queen, however, liked Frumentius enough that she offered to keep him in the palace in a paid position, as the personal tutor of the young princess Anna. Frumentius, eager to influence the next king of Oxum, gladly accepted the position. Part of Christianity's global success can be attributed to its emphasis on proselytism, or the practice of trying to convince others to adopt the faith. Throughout history, missionary work has traditionally been viewed positively by Christians, and Frumentius, an extremely devout man, was no exception. In his hours between teaching his honor, Frumentius also went to work trying to spread his faith among the locals, as well as organizing a more defined church structure for Oxum's existing Christian population. He encouraged Oxumite Christians to coordinate worship efforts, establishing some of the earliest churches and chapels in East Africa. Most significantly, he completed the first translation of the Bible into Gaez, an achievement that made the book far more accessible to the general public. In the year 325, Azana came of age and was finally allowed to rule in his own right. Frumentius, a lifelong teacher and friend, declared that his job was done, and that he planned to return to his hometown of Tyre to receive a religious education. After all, throughout the whole time he'd been in Oxum, performing baptisms and building centers of worship, he was technically just some guy, not officially a priest, bishop, or any other position of religious authority. So, he promised to return to Oxum once he had attained his priesthood, and then he would continue his work as a missionary, in a more official sense. Izana, on the other hand, was now finally able to govern on his own for the first time. Knowing that he was brought up under the influence of the incredibly devout Frumentius, we can assume that even in this early stage of his reign, Izana had some pretty strong Christian sympathies. But, despite these sympathies, Izana remained, at least publicly, a practitioner of the traditional faith of Oxumite paganism. While practicing Christianity was acceptable in Oxum, a king openly forsaking the traditional ways and converting to this strange Jewish cult would be seen as scandalous, to say the least. Coins that depict Oxum from this early era of his reign showcase Azana's profile underneath a horizontal disc and crescent symbol. This disc and crescent was present on all Oxumite coins from kings before Azana, and was meant to represent the power of Oxum's pantheon of gods. Meanwhile, upon his return to Tyre, Frumentius found himself in a Roman world that had changed immensely in his absence. While Frumentius had grown up in a Roman Empire that was still persecuting Christians, in the year 313 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine had converted to Christianity and declared the legalization of the faith, ending the last persecutions within the empire. Christianity, as an underground sect, was very poorly organized, lacking any sort of official canon, and with multiple different interpretations of the faith taking root in communities around the empire. Now, in 325, the Emperor Constantine ordered that Christianity demanded a unified, official framework and structure. He gathered a number of important bishops and other authorities within the early church at the city of Nicaea, where they would create the first ever official church doctrine, the Nicene Creed. While the theological details of the creed are incredibly interesting, they unfortunately fall outside of this podcast purview, and thus will not be discussed here. What is relevant to our story, though, is that the Council of Nicaea essentially split the Christian world in two. On the one hand, there were the Nicaean Christians, who accepted this new official doctrine, and on the other, there was a group called the Arian Christians. Wholly unrelated to the antiquated term for blue-eyed, blonde hair people, Arian Christianity was far more popular in the western parts of the empire. It was a sect that followed the beliefs of a Libyan priest named Arius, and disagreed with many tenets of the Nicene Creed. Most importantly, they disagreed on the matter of Trinity. The Trinity is a belief in Christianity that God has three forms, the Son, Father, and Holy Spirit. Nicene Christians believe that these three forms are united in essence, and that the Father and Son are co-equal to each other. 
while Arian Christians believe that the Son, by being created by the Father, was therefore subservient and inferior. With the Nicene Creed now declared the official dogma of the Church, Arians were declared heretics, and a widespread persecution of Arian practitioners began. Fortunately for Frumentius, he was a Nicene, so he was able to continue advancing his education unmolested by Church authorities. After he had achieved his priesthood, Frumentius made a trip to meet with the Patriarch of Alexandria, the highest authority of Christianity in Egypt. There, Frumentius begged the Patriarch to let him make a return to Oxum and convert the locals. Apparently, the Patriarch was charmed by Frumentius's personality, impressed with his experience in Oxum, and sympathetic with his goals. He ended up appointing him to an even higher position than Frumentius expected. He was declared the Archbishop of Ethiopia, and all African lands to the south of Egypt, and shipped out with an entourage of missionaries to Oxum in the year 330. Izana, now a full-grown man, was elated when his childhood mentor and friend returned after spending so many years away. He was eager to tell Frumentius about all the things that he had achieved since he left, and indeed, Izana had achieved a lot. Soon after taking the throne, Izana immediately wanted to confront one of Oxum's most consistent challenges, banditry. The roads built by King Gadarat a century ago, meant to connect Roman Egypt and the cities of Oxum, had unfortunately become a haven for gangs and bandits. The terrestrial route was so risky, in fact, that by the start of Izana's reign, it was essentially unused. After all, shipping materials through the Red Sea was cheaper, faster, and now safer, too. However, this wasn't a problem that could just be ignored. For starters, many of the towns that ran across this road between Oxum and Egypt were important supply and repair stops for the thousands of ships that made the Red Sea voyage each year. Izana likely grew up frequently hearing stories from Frumentius about the potential brutal consequences that could happen if the crew of a docked ship was attacked by bandits. Izana figured that, by freeing the local area from bandits, he could reinvigorate the terrestrial trade route, make repairs and resupplying safer for sailors, and expand Oxmite influence northwards, all in one decision. The road to Egypt was populated by a loose federation of pastoral tribes, known as the Beja. These tribes would migrate back and forth across the dry coasts of the Red Sea. It was a harsh lifestyle that bred a tough people. Azana knew that a traditional military conquest, marching in with armies and subjugating the locals by force, simply wouldn't work against a hardened people like the Beja. Instead, he devised an alternative strategy. Instead of subjugating the Beja, he would assist them in their relocation, reducing the number of Beja tribes to a more manageable level. Azana sent his trusted brother, Saizana, into the Beja territory with an Oxumite army behind him. Saizana approached the elders of six different Beja tribes, and politely offered, albeit at the tip of a spear, to assist them in moving their tribes to new lands. To ensure compliance, the lands he offered were actually better than the ones that the Beja currently lived in. These lands were the more fertile and generally more livable lands of inland Nubia. By accepting his proposition, these tribes would actually be receiving better land in addition to avoiding war with Oxum. Saizana and his army followed the long trail of thousands of migrating Beja to their new homeland. However, they quickly ran into a problem. While they had promised to move the Beja into this new Nubian land, they hadn't exactly consulted the Nubians about it. After arriving, they had to threaten the Nubian inhabitants of the land into allowing the new Beja arrivals to live among them. The Nubians, of course, unable to stand up to such a large Oxumite army, reluctantly conceded and let the Beja in. With a portion of the Beja tribe successfully transplanted into inland Nubia, they were no longer a problem for the Oxumite state. The remaining Beja tribes could be managed more easily, and banditry in the region soon ground to a halt. Through clever diplomatic maneuvering and unconventional use of the military, Azana had achieved all of his goals on the Red Sea coast. He severely reduced banditry, renewed the value of the region to merchants, and expanded Oxumite influence. Best of all, he did this with minimal bloodshed and at a low expense. Truly, the campaign against the Beja was successful on all accounts. Frumentius was likely impressed by the stories of this immensely well-executed campaign, but he had returned to Oxum not to catch up with old friends, but to save souls. Izana, who obviously continued the practice of tolerating Christians within the Oxumite Empire, was perfectly fine with Frumentius' missionary work. However, when Frumentius offered to baptize Izana himself, 
he was forced to refuse. He didn't want to upset the status quo and risk delegitimizing his own position. After all, legitimacy to his honest claim to the throne came from that he was supposedly a descendant of the god Macher. By converting to Christianity, Azan would be basically denying his own divine ancestry. While Azan harbored Christian sympathies within his own mind and heart, he couldn't just up and convert. What would the nobility think? And what would the Romans think? The Romans are Oxum's biggest trading partner, and they totally hate Christians, isn't that right, Frumentius? When Oxum learned that the Emperor of Rome, Constantine, had converted to Christianity himself, suddenly the concept of conversion didn't seem so extreme anymore. While he maintained that he couldn't just suddenly declare himself to be a Christian, he thought that maybe more gradual conversion would be preferable, and could even lend him some positive credibility with their Roman allies. In his royal proclamations written in Gaez, Azana branded himself as neither a Christian nor a polytheist. Rather, he was a henotheist, meaning someone who acknowledges the existence of multiple gods, but believes that only one is worthy of worship. In a Gaea's engraving meant to commemorate his victories against the Beja, Azana broke with traditional Aksumite writing. Previous kings, like Godarot, for example, waxed endlessly about the specific gods who helped them in their struggles, something like, I smote the enemy armies, my spear was blessed by the will of the war god Macher. But instead, Azana wrote in his inscription, My victory is owed to the might of the Lord of Heaven who has created me and the Lord of all by whom the king is beloved. This is no reference to the Christian god, but nor is there reference to any of the old gods of the Oxumite pantheon. Instead, he credits this vague concept of the Lord of Heaven, a sort of indirect nod to monotheism in a way that would make sense to his subjects, but would not startle or upset the nobility. In his Greek-language documents, however, Izana was far more forthright, directly crediting the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost to the strength of his rule. This was a perfect compromise. To his subjects, Azana was a henotheist, a legitimate ruler and still a descendant of the gods, but who just so happened to worship only one of them. To the foreign merchants who carried news back to Rome, he was a fully and unabashedly Christian monarch who we should probably cultivate stronger trade ties and alliances with. For his part, Frumentius and the missionaries began a more aggressive approach in spreading the Christian faith to the Oxumite populace. They adopted a syncretic model of Christianity, adopting compatible elements of Oxum's culture into the religion they espoused. When speaking of God and Gaez, they translated the name God into Astar, the chief god of the Oxumite pantheon. This could allow people to understand this foreign religion in a way that would be more familiar to them. Additionally, to avoid confusion, Frumentius instructed his missionaries to focus more on the Old Testament and to omit references to the Trinity. The Trinity of God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one of the most unique and confusing aspects of the Christian faith. Remember, Frumentius had just returned from the Roman world, where questions over the matter of trinities were already tearing Christianity asunder. So, between its confusing nature and potential divisiveness, Frumentius simply decided to, well, just skip it at least until people were strongly committed enough to the faith to learn more about it. With this new strategy, Frumentius' spreading of the faith accelerated immensely. For the first time in Oxumite history, large masses of people, including the peasants, were converting to Christianity. Despite Azana's personal trepidation in adopting an openly Christian royal persona during the early stages of his rule, this would gradually change over time. Azana's Christian sympathies would slowly become more public. However, while his reign had been nothing but positivity so far, Azana would soon have to face his first true major challenge during his time as king. The Nubian kingdom of Kush, Aksum's longtime rival, will decline into anarchy, leading to chaos on Aksum's northern border. Join us next episode as Azana responds to the Nubian crisis and oversees the conversion of Aksum into Africa's first Christian kingdom. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested.